Uh, Chris Carhill, who is um, president of the New Zealand Police Association, uh, talking about the protest at Parliament this week. But um, that's not why we've got him on the show. We've got a few other things to talk about him, uh, particularly this remarkable uh, story about law and order and the ram raids. Uh, joining us is the president of the New Zealand Police Association, Chris Carhill. Chris, good morning to you. Good morning, Michael. Um, first of all, I'm going to have you on. Do you mind? No problem at all. Got you're, a, skin. you're a good man. Um, you moaned about the fact that, well, I heard you moaning on our news about the fact that um, 500 police staff were diverted from doing essential police jobs because of the Tamaki protest at Parliament uh, earlier in the week. Um, are you saying that people shouldn't be able to protest at Parliament? No, I'm certainly not. I, I, and I did sort of, you know, that's the thing when you hear part of an interview. Police certainly, uh, people certainly have the right to protest, um, and, but, and, but police will have to be deployed when these things happen. I think this, the situation I had an issue with is protesting that goes beyond lawful. And that's what happened back in March, and that's why you had to have so many police there uh, on Tuesday, is the, the threat of it becoming an unlawful protest. Uh, if it was a normal protest, you wouldn't have 500 officers dragged away from other duties. Mm, okay. Um, but it, it was a normal protest and really um, wasn't there... I, I, I commented, we interviewed Brian Tamagy before the protest. We interviewed the Mayor of Wellington, also Andy Foster. They both made great play of the fact that this was going to be a lawful protest and um, and I think looking at it, it was clearly designed to be and it clearly was. Uh, do you think the authorities got a bit over anxious? Oh, I think they had to be extra cautious. I mean, given that police were heavily criticised for not, not acting quick enough in March, oh, yeah, yeah. without a doubt, they, they would have had more resources available just to be on the safe side. And look, I think everyone was pleased that it went the way it did. And if that's the way people are going to protest, totally appropriate. You know, yeah. Whether we agree with what they're saying or yeah. who they are, if they do it that way, all well and good. Yeah, I, I think. I think. Mark, yeah, I think. I, I, I think you've got to sort of look at the people who are doing it. I think Tamaki has got a bit of a history of. Um, Doing, having quite ordering quite a good show. Listen, the other thing that came out um, before we go on to the other issue I've got you on the show for, uh, there have been 129 ram raids since March in New Zealand, 84 of them in Auckland. Um, uh, with all due respect, what are the police doing about it? Because it seems that there is no answer. It is difficult. Um, look, look, it was interesting. I, I saw that the, the clearance rate for ram raids was something like 37% which mightn't sound great, but I'll tell you, it's a lot higher than many other offences. Yeah, Burglaries, that's right. Mm. It's about 10%. So uh, they are doing a lot. The challenge is, what I understand, my information is the vast majority of these, well over 90% of these, are committed by the same group of offenders. There's apparently a, about 40 um, youths based in Waitamata, Counties Manukau and Hamilton, who are doing these, and they're doing them, putting them online. It's almost a a competition amongst each other. And the hardcore offenders are the, that top 1% or 2% of youth offenders that you just can't break through to. Uh, and the problem is, of course, that we don't have the ability to just lock these people up and throw away the key. That's not how it works anymore. And look, in fairness, it didn't work in the past. They just turned into hardened criminals. So it is really difficult, Michael. Uh, and it's frustrating for officers. And, of course, then we have things like you can't pursue them and that's... You know, makes it a little bit harder at the time. So, yeah, it's it's difficult. And uh, certainly for, for the people well, who are the victim of them. Well, I was just going to say, um, uh, it's difficult is probably not a good policy response. Uh, what could the government be doing from your point of view that they're not doing now? Well, I think that, you know, that it's limited what the government can do, but I think that what they'd have to do is make available to these... Um, business owners, the security that they need, whether that's paying for bollards for them, making so certainly when you hear stories about they can't get resource consent to put them in, that's absolutely ridiculous. So speeding up all those sort of things is important, I think, without a doubt. But, I mean, we also have to look at the, some of the, you know, the atrocious uh, number of people, not children not going to school in New Zealand these days. Mm -hmm. That's only going to lead to more of this behaviour. Yeah, that, that. that's there's, true. There's some bigger issues to do, but please... And saying that, police have to be out there on the street. I mean, we need, uh, you know, police need to look at where their resources are and say, what's the biggest issue at the moment? What is affecting the public's view of how safe they feel? And I think you need to see more officers on the street at night so they're more likely to be in those places that these youths are going to. Okay. Um, and at the moment, we're stretched right across too many different areas 
Well, I mean, one of the things that automatically seems to, uh, I imagine people listening to this too, Chris would say, well, wait on, if there are only 40 hardcore youths committing most of these ram raids, why don't you just take them off the street and arrest the buggers? Well, they do get arrested, but of course they then get released. Um, they're not kept in secure facilities. The facilities that they may be placed in Tauranga Tamariki, they simply walk out of. Um, and so the they're the same offenders repeating constantly um, and that's the challenge they, they, you know, they're not 18 year olds that can go to prison um, and that's just the way the situation is in New Zealand so um, you know, no matter how often police are dealing with some of these people they just seem to return again and again mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah well there's, there's an ongoing policy debate there I'm sure we'll have it on the show later on um, now the other issue I really rang up about also was to do with the incredible saga that has been inflicted upon one of your members and that is Constable Keith Abbott. Uh, last week uh, the Court of Appeal published their latest and let's hope last uh, judgment on this matter and dismissing the uh, private or the, the, the petition of, um, of Stephen Wallace's mother aided and abetted by various activists over the years. It's been 22 years since Steve Wallace was killed, but uh, it's also almost been that since uh, one of your members has gone through the process. Is this the inevitable consequence of shooting somebody when they attack you? It shouldn't be. This shouldn't be how it's unfolded. I mean, Constable A was called out of bed in the middle of the night 22 years ago. He's never been back to his house since. Uh, that's the reality for him. His life changed forever. And it's gone on for 22 years. His house was firebombed. Uh, you know, his whole, his his family was ruined. You know, in the end, that constables have to leave New Zealand to try and get on with his life. Good grief! Yet 22 years later, he's still been haunted by it, remembering that he's found to be justified at every level that the legal system has challenged it on. At every level, uh, he was. He was put in a situation where a violent offender was trying to inflict serious harm that's not death upon him, and he had to act in a split second. 22 years later, he's still having to face those consequences. It's time for this to stop. Yeah. Um, will, will this be it? I mean, do you think there's a, there's a continuation of this still after the Court of Appeal judgment? You wouldn't think so. You would like to think the Supreme Court wouldn't... Um, would say enough is enough yeah. and that will be the end of it but I mean we've unfortunately we've said this many times before and something else has arisen um, look this really started from police getting things wrong right at the start um, they left a vacuum of information and it was filled by the idea that Stephen Wallace was shot for breaking windows he wasn't shot for breaking windows he was shot for threatening an officer with a weapon and, and an assertion. And remember, this was the day before tasers. Police, uh, the police had very limited other options to deal with him. Um, and that void sort of created the problem right from the start. Uh, and, and it's just compounded over the years with misinformation. And look, I totally understand the, the trauma that, that the Wallace family's gone through and how they, they feel, you know, they've totally lost a loved one. But that shouldn't mean that Constable A has had to suffer for 22 years as well when he's been found to be justified at every possible uh, opportunity. I mean, he was privately prosecuted. Every morning he had to sit down in a prison cell you know, while he waited to go to court, again, to be found not guilty by a jury of his peers. So you know, no one should have to go through that when the facts are actually clear. Mm. Um, now, obviously, uh, there have been a lot more police shootings uh, in the last 22 years since Stephen Wallace was shot and killed. Um, and you get a feeling, don't you? I mean, I do from looking at it from outside in, Chris, that whenever the police shoot somebody, there are always people ready to suggest that this was a misuse of police authority. Um, is that just, is that getting worse or is, is it getting better? No, it's probably getting worse, but look, I, I think there's two points. One, one good thing that has come out from a police perspective from ha how Constable A was treated is we've worked with police and we now have a critical incident policy that ensures the officers get the appropriate uh, care and, and protections that are required. So we're really pleased that something positive has come out of this. But to answer your question more, look, I think it's totally fair 
that these issues are scrutinised. Mm. And, and look, while it might seem a lot, they're a very small number. So each has to be looked at on its own individual circumstances. And they are. I mean, they're looked at, you know, from a, you, you have a police code of conduct investigation. You have an IPCA investigation. You know, you have a coronial investigation. You've got a criminal investigation. And then nowadays you, you, you can pretty much guarantee you've got a private investigation by somebody as well. And I'm not saying that that is appropriate because someone has lost their life. Uh, but it has to also be balanced against looking at the facts as they are on that individual situation, not trying to say because a certain number of people have been killed in the last 10 years, that says you've got a problem. There are two smaller figures to say that. No, it was really interesting, though, how the police handle it, and I think your criticism was right, that a narrative was allowed to be established before the truth was allowed to be promoted. We know what the truth was now. Uh, as you say, it's been examined independently. It's been verified by the courts on a number of occasions. But I'm just thinking, is that still the case now? I'm thinking back, you know, to the shooting of um, earlier this year, that uh, chap Chaos Price. Remember that one? In Taranaki. Yes. And, and I was wondering, and, and immediately the media were there, and the, the nature of the media today is they've always got to have something new every hour. So ev even if they haven't got something, they'll try and make something up or get a new angle or something like that. And so they interviewed witnesses and witnesses said things, so immediately that gets put up as news. Do you think the New Zealand police need to be a bit more proactive and a bit more open and transparent in dealing with these issues? Because there always seems to be, oh, well, this matter's under police investigation now, independent police capates authority, can't comment on it. And it, it really leads a vacuum into which, well, a whole series of badness can intrude, doesn't it? Yeah, it is. That, it's very important that police fill that vacuum quickly or, or don't allow a vacuum to be created. And look, in general, I believe they've got a lot better at it. It's difficult to comment on ones that is currently active, and a, you know, but, but some of them are more difficult than others to do that. Um, and and you know, the circumstances aren't always as clear in some as others. But I think police in general have learnt that lesson. And um, you know, we're certainly very much aware of it here. And if police mm. don't come up with the facts quickly, then I will try and fill them, even though it's, it's certainly more a police role to say what's going on than mine. Um, and, yeah, I guess, and, I, I guess that's right. I mean, you're the, you're the man, aren't you? You've got to do it. If the police say, listen, then you've got to defend your members, don't you? I do, but I'd much prefer that police just put the facts that can can be um, released out there as soon as possible. And look, in general, now they do. Uh, I can certainly think of some really positive examples where that's happened, and it's shut down misinformation quickly. But I do acknowledge that it can be difficult when not all the facts are known immediately. You don't yeah. want to say things that prove to be incorrect, mm. um, and some cases aren't quite as clear as others. And, of course, the officer needs time to regroup before they can tell their story as well. So police may not always have all the facts straight away. No, fair enough. All right, Chris, thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate your time and your effort and your energy. Um, all power to you. Good on you. Thanks very much. That's Chris Cahill, who's president of the New Zealand Police Association. Difficult job. Very powerful group, though, the New Zealand Police Association.